Welcome to Understanding Your Power. The first thing, uh, you know, I, I, first of all, I just want to bless the beginning of the workshop, which I always do. I do it in my heart. You may as well know what I'm doing that. So I always say this prayer, hover over us, God. Bless this. And it's, um, I do that for all kinds of reasons, not the least of which is I believe that um, when anybody sets off on a, an experience, a conversation, a relationship on anything that has the potential to change you, that has the potential to help you to understand anything more accurately, you go through a very vulnerable place. You crack open a little bit and in that moment of cracking open you become very vulnerable because you know the world that you were just in is gone it is gone and it may be just a room that you're living or it may be the whole house you were living in or it could be the planet or maybe you're living leaving your galaxy so to speak but every time you learn something that is more accurate more authentic or true than what you were just believing. That world evaporates in front of your eye. Just like that. And this is the nature, not just of power, but of what, what we, um, what it is we do with this substance called power. The other day I was in Nordstrom's and, and this woman helped me out when I was, you know, running through this and that and up and down. And she had alopecia. And I didn't even notice and I didn't notice because not having hair is in fact fashionable. And things have become fashionable that in, when I was younger would never have been fashionable. It was not fashionable when I was 20 to pierce your nose or to, anyway, it was not fashionable to do any of that. I'm thinking of my niece, but we won't go there. Um, but I didn't actually notice. So as we were talking, and then we just, we started to just have a really good time, and we're chatting and this and that, and then she said something. She said, thank you for not commenting on my baldness. Okay, so I, I looked at her, and I said, I thought it was a choice, because you look so good. <laughs> I said, your makeup's beautiful, your eye makeup's beautiful, and it happens that I have a friend who actually looks very similar to her, and it is a choice with her. She doesn't want to be bothered with her hair. So she wears it very cropped, and sometimes she just does that, and she's very radical, and she just, you know, she, sometimes she just does this and that, and I don't know, she just does. And it is a choice for her, so it didn't occur to me that it wasn't a choice for her, for this woman. And then she told me that in fact she had been um, infected with something, maybe a bug bite, maybe this, maybe that. But she broke out into all these sores and the consequence of that was this and then that was this and then that was this and then this was that. She lost her hair, it's not coming back. It's an incredible story. The bottom line is, as we stood there in Nordstrom's, my holding a bag in this she said, and she followed me all the way to the door, not because she, she doesn't know anything about what I do. I just, I just can't stop. <laughs> right. Um, she said, so the doctor said to me, you just have to let nature take its course and bring you to balance. And this is a word that 
is an operative word for us. Bring you to balance. Bring you to balance. Bring your power to balance is part of what I consider to be the new spiritual bio-echo theology of our time. Where, you, where we finally understand that our ecology, our bio-spiritual ecology, is identical with the laws of nature. That our nature, the laws of nature, the cosmos, are an, a growing duplicate of each other. An actual duplicate of each other. And that as we bring our individual system to balance, we balance the whole ecosystem. So, and I thought, when I was younger, when I went to, when I remember my mother taking me to the family doctor when I was young because I had a flu bug, a flu, you know, um, and I can't imagine the doctor telling my mom she has to be, we have to reestablish a state of balance. That wouldn't have been a language then, but it is a language now. Now, I think the, I have become accustomed, part of my style is to open up a workshop with a great perspective, a grand perspective of where we are now on the map of our own evolution. Because I think it's all too easy to not have a perspective of why you are, of, of what it means to be alive now and the significance of this time in, and this time, this moment in time. And I am always, always, always looking at this moment in time through the historic prism, through, through sociological, through, any, any, uh, through a con anything that gets me to examine the awesome nature of what it means to be alive now because I see this as the most pivotal time in the history of civilization. That is the biggest sentence I will ever say. Not the biggest words, not the most sophisticated, but certainly the biggest sentence I will ever say. The history of civilization. It's impossible to comprehend all that is happening now. But to just put it in bite size, tiny little bite size, itsy bitsy bite size. I, I, all, I, want, I want to keep us here to midnight and I want to draw it on the wall. I want to draw the map in my head that, that speaks to me 24 seven. And of course, <laughs> you'd probably run out of here and say, how do you live with yourself? <laughs> My mother's, even he said, can't you turn your mind off? I'm going to the show with Fran. Um, okay. There's, we're going to go into this in great detail, so I'm just going to go fast. But for myself, personally, in my own journey, I realized somewhere along the line that what, what, when I started out as a medical intuitive, so this is going to play big into you understanding why you have different impulses now. Why we, as a new generation, have more senses than our elders did. We are a different species. We really are a different species. We have energetic senses that were not animated when our parents were growing up or our grandparents, depending on your age. They became animated when we entered the nuclear age. They became animated because it's, we went literally from living in a kind of a, a, a vertical world 
to a step, I mean a horizontal world, to entering a vertical consciousness where things would happen simultaneously. Where we <clears throat> would develop the capacity to perceive and manifest in instantaneously. I'm going to hit a pause button. That is what Jesus did. That is what Buddha did. That is what we call a miraculous healing, where in the name of Jesus, let this be healed. And it goes from matter and it returns to light. The cancer goes from matter, physical matter, and it disintegrates into light and it leaves your body instantly. It is called a miracle. When, when we call, when an event happens, out of the order of horizontal time, but it happens in vertical time. So it goes from light to matter, from matter to light, instantly. Vertical time is mystic time. Jesus time, Buddha time. Are you with me here? Okay. Now. Hmm. Um, when I, I guess it's 10 or 12 years ago now, a long time ago now, pretty much so. When I got involved in mysticism, when I had a brief encounter with Teresa of Avila, I entered vertical time. Everything changed. My perceptions went, <coughs> I had seizures. My wiring was just burned and I went, my short-term memory became trashed. I lost half my vocabulary. But other wires engaged. Other wires. And perceptions that I didn't, wasn't able to see before or sense before, I could sense. So I lost some ground, but I gained space. I lost ground, I gained space. Okay, let me be very clear here. But as I, as this part of me developed, in gaining this inner space, when I would read, I, I found myself reading, um, you know, the, 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 the writings of Teresa of Avila. So now we're in the 1500s. And the next thing I was reading, um, more and more about the mystics of old. I read John of the Cross. I read Ignatius Loyola. I read Francis. I was going what we would call backwards in time. But if I looked at it through a different lens, I was going into a deeper space of perception. So let me say this differently. And if I lose you, and believe me, I get that, because we're going into a, a labyrinth of a forest here. Um, I was going into experiential territory where the mind could not keep up with the experience. Where logic and reason were no longer my primary tools, but, <clears throat> but experience without logic and reason. What I had to rely on was more of a sense of how much could I allow myself to let my world change and still be in my world. Are you, are you with me here? Now what this required 
was me. I was with my spiritual director every single week for two hours. He's a theologian and a Jungian analyst. And it required that I hold very, very tight to the reins of what your imagination is capable of and what you are capable of imagining. Now, this is a thin line. This is, this is a remarkable question to ponder within yourself. A question I want you and we will, a I want to ask you is where do you dwell? Do you dwell in fiction within yourself? Do you dwell in places that you have imagined, in things you've imagined, in conversations you've imagined, in ideas you've imagined, in images of yourself that you have imagined that have not really happened, but therein you dwell? But therein you dwell. Images of yourself as, if only I was, if only I lived, if only I had been, if only I had done, do you dwell in some place other than yourself or in this time or in this place? Do you, are you, is your imagination, when you ask me, for example, I want to ignite a passion, then what you actually said to me is, I'm no longer in my life. I'm no longer here and I don't know how to come home again. And I can't find anything in my life that ignites my appetite. My life has ceased to seduce me. And I am sad and broken about that. So I am window shopping for my life. That's what you told me. So I ask you, where are you dwelling? Because fiction has caught you. Are you, are you with me here? Now, on my deep journey that took me backwards and backwards and backwards, ever backwards, from the 1200s, as I went into to Francis of Assisi, what, and I, I have to say, I want to speak to you for a moment about why was this significant to me? And number two, did it matter that it was a Catholic journey? No, because it wasn't just a Catholic journey. I was reading deeply the work of Buddha. I was, I, this, but this is where it started because of Teresa. And secondly, because Jesus is the, is the great cosmic teacher of healing. Buddha is the great cosmic teacher of chipping away of illusion, illusion of what your mind is capable of doing. Why it matters, and it matters deeply, is because in going through journeys of power and in yourself, what I learn again and again with myself and then in consequence with I take it to you is that we are the authors of why we suffer <coughs> by the fiction in which we dwell by so much of what Buddha would say we want this to be real but it's not we want this to be real we think this is real but it's not but it's not We want the world to be other than the way it is, or our world to be other than the way it is, but it's not. The management, what life is about is not dying. Life is about managing your power in every choice you make, in every thought you have, in every breath you take, that you are able to stand in front of something so egregious and not let it call one ounce of your power. Not one ounce. Absolutely not one. 
That's what life's about. That you can leave this planet and take every particle with you at the end of your life and say, I'm not leaving a scrap of my soul behind. It's not in any unfinished business. I don't have any energetic debts. This time I did it right. It's not about dying. It's about choice, power, self-knowledge. It's about recognizing, and I have that pattern. I had it 400 lifetimes ago. It's hell. But you can do it. Okay? Now, as I went back and back, I mean, I, I realized that I think the most difficult thing for me to communicate, and probably one of the most important, is how powerful myth is in our lives. And <clears throat> when I said it's important to understand what's happening now, because what's happening now is all of our collective myths are falling apart. Every single one of them. And so we have a planet, we are a planet in, in, that has no idea what to believe at all. We've tossed out everything and become people who don't even know how to believe anything. We are ripe for a demonic takeover or an angelic transformation. Both are true. Both are true. We have never been as vulnerable as we are now. And I think that this turning point is literally a cognitive quantum leap that we stand on the precipice of. And if we go backwards and really look at, you know, I, I can't speak like a, a, an um, archaeologist or a, you know, an expert on, 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 you know, Neanderthals or whatever, but I've read a lot of books on that period, you know, four or five, and it's very interesting um, how they try to discern what consciousness was like at that time. You know, we're Neanderthals and the early Homo sapiens, which, by the way, they postulate that these were two different species, and they lived at the same time. And so this is, this, I, I just find this very fascinating. What was their consciousness like? What was it like? Well, here's something that is significant. The likelihood is that it was very, very basic in that it was physical. It was physical. That where their attention was, was in here, in the here, in the physical. And then, one day, somehow, imagination was born. One day, somehow, an event like this happened. A man was walking through the desert, and he heard a voice, and it said, Abram. Abram. And he says, who is talking to me, Lord? The invisible world spoke for the first time. An incomprehensible thing happened. Only the physical world spoke. But now through this faculty they never had before, called their imagination. The invisible world spoke. Do you know what this means? It means that humanity suddenly could dialogue with that which it could imagine is possible. Is it possible? 
that there's something greater than us out there. How did this being speak? It spoke through the elements. What did it want? Well, it wants something of us. Are we significant? Well, maybe we are. Because imagination was born, because they could image, they then created what this being must be like. What is this being like? Well, I don't know. Well, he spoke. How did he speak? He spoke through the bush, through fire. Fire spoke. Now, what was not created was doubt. They didn't say, which bush? Not your rose bush, because I like that rose bush. It was so awesome. And he said, get, we have to get going. This voice wants us to go that direction. Well, then let's go. Well, let's go. What are we waiting for? And off they went. Faith was born. Faith was born. From this invisible world, Human, human beings began to carve themselves as if they turned inside and began to chisel this density that was just flesh and bones and go and this thing, faith, this thing, curiosity, this thing, imagination. These faculties that didn't exist when they were simply scouring for something to eat. Now they were wondering, does it matter what we do? Does it matter? And from this, they began to create the idea that this being wanted something from them. And in order to, to keep this being with them, they had to collectively believe in this being. What did this being say? This being said, well, look at this. He gave us 10 commandments. Whoa, whoa. What did we have to believe these. And from this came what we call myth, a collective idea that we all agree to believe. Well, I'll agree that. I'll believe that. I'll believe that. And that belief, these beliefs, tie us together more surely, as tightly, as it's like spiritual, it's our sacred DNA. It's our sacred DNA, our myth, our collective myth, that there's something up there that somehow, somehow, at the last minute, no matter what lunacy takes place in any world capital, they really won't get to that button. They really won't blow us up because our collective myth believes that there's an off-planet daddy God that will sweep in and say, that's enough. That's enough. Now you stop it. Because our imagination cannot possibly imagine Something as horrible as that. Because what we say is, how can God allow? Our myth doesn't allow for that. Except that now, here's the crisis. We've abandoned a number of those myths, rendering them dysfunctional, obsolete. Number two is, <clears throat> Those myths are colliding with each other. And number three is we've replaced none of them with anything better. Absolutely none of them with anything better. So when I say that we are at a vulnerable time, everybody feels that there's something, something hanging over us or rising from within us. Rises of opioid, opioid crises, suicides, 
it's become ordinary in our society to have someone walk in to a classroom and blow his classmates away. And we scream and yell for a few days and then we go along right back with it because it's ordinary for us now. It is ordinary. This is not considered abnormal for us now. Tragic, yes. Abnormal, no. Violence is way up here. In other words, we are a people going backwards into a kind of madness. Into a kind of madness. My sense, and I hope I can communicate this as clearly as I think I may have a little bit of a finger on a pulse, is that we've reached a place where we need to imagine more than we have allowed ourselves to imagine. We need to push ourselves to become more than we have thought about becoming. I think we need to imagine possibilities and probabilities and potentials in us much bigger than we have, but the price is much bigger than we've imagined we could pay. Both are true. I, ne I, I think we need to, to understand that we have actually entered the age of the unthinkable. Not the thinkable, not the reasonable, but the unthinkable. Where the things we cannot have imagined before are fully capable of happening and might well indeed happen. There is no off-planet God that is going to sweep down and save us. That myth is never, is, is, the lights are out. You cannot have for 50 years a scaffold a myth that says you create your own reality and then decide to toss it out when things get bad and hope some off-planet God comes in and covers your backside. You can't have this both ways, do you understand? It doesn't work that way. We are in the era of creating our own reality. From our body, up to our country, up to our planet, to our global village, to our environment, to everything. Because this is the time of discovering that every thought we have is an act of creation. And there's no going back now. There's no going back. So we either rise up to that or we don't. I think a lot of people will not, and this will take down a lot of people. In the, in the exact, I'm not the least bit sentimental. I don't have a sentimental bone in my body. I don't, not at all. And I think a lot of people will not be able to make a transition like this. And I get that. That it's, that it, that, that you know, we, j just like I can't make the technical transition. I can't do it. I will never be a geek. It's never going to happen. I will always have to hire someone to do that. So there's a lot of, uh, there, there's a lot that, uh, you know, we're in between worlds and there's a lot of things that, okay, but if we are studying together, it is because there is a part of you that knows you've left behind that world. You've left it behind. There's a part of you that is very, that, that is feeling, I, I need to get my, I need to understand how I work better than the way I understand now. 
you need to, to recognize how much power you actually have in the power of everything that you have, from the words that you use, to the way you look at people, to the sound of your voice, to the way you get up in the morning and decide, am I gonna call this a lovely day or a disastrous day? That even the choice of those words sets in motion biochemical responses in your body that could determine whether or not that day you animate the flu. Could just be enough to change your biochemistry enough because you decided that day, this today is just a disaster. That in fact, it's time that we start living the truth that we are active systems of the laws of the universe, cause and effect, act, action and reaction, the law of sensing, the law of everything, that we are systems that are completely constant acts of co-creation. And that, that is the power of God operating in our system. This is that divine, these are divine molecules in action. This is how it works. This is the significance of to the, the now. When I, let me just finish a little bit on my journey. I don't know how I'm doing with time. Okay, we, you have a di we dinner date and I'm not supposed to allow us to be late tonight. <laughs> okay, so, um, you know, in, in this little walk I took backwards, after I studied, after I poured myself into Francis and then Ignatius Loyola, Loyola Francis, and then I went back to the Desert Fathers and then I went into, you know, the, I, I was in the Upanishads, and, I, and what I mean by that is I'd saturate myself and read it and be there like for two months, three months, and then I'd go back to And then I got to, back to Plato and Aristotle. And The Light in the Cave, by the way, is a brilliant book if you want to read something delicious. And um, then I had to teach a class in Pythagoras, in mathematics, in, from the mystery school. And I had to, I, I took eight books of Pythagoras and I started to uh, read this because I, I didn't know enough at all. But I had such a transformation at that point. And here's what happened. I had crossed a significant Rubicon. And going way back and going into the Greeks and into the area of Pythagoras, I left the psychic field of Judeo-Christianity, which is a very animated tradition of um, God and man and God looking like us and this bio-divine connection and all the trouble it's created. All the trouble it's created. And I got into the Old Testament. And well, they, they don't have that. You know, you have to look like us. And they, they never said what the Messiah was going to be. They didn't say you have to be, you know, look like us, this, this. <coughs> But as I got into the Old Testament, and then I got into Pythagoras and all these characters, and I, as I was studying that and Buddhism, which was at the same time, roughly about 2500 BC, um, I mean 500 BC, I realized what they had in common was there's a purity to that knowledge. It is only knowledge without myth. Pythagoras is simply mathematics. Aristotle is simply on reason. Plato is simply on virtue and laws of the Republic. Um, 
in studying these Euripides, in studying the mystery schools, in studying um, that. And for some reason, I look at the Old Testament and I started to read about Abraham. And I made this leap that during this time, the energy that was the consciousness that was on the planet, that was managing the planet, was so receptive and it wasn't filled with doubt. It was just as if everybody on the planet was saying, what are the rules here? So this, this lightning bolt of, of Pythagoras said, give me the rules of mathematics. How does, how does, and here comes you know, Aristotle and Plato and they, they, they get lined up like the north and the south, you take beauty, I'll take, and virtue, and I'll take logic and reason, and they form the two threads that would become the western mind, like the two tributaries that would become western thinking. They, and here, when I read uh, um, Abram saying that he spoke to two angels, and he said they showed up, and I said, take them into the tent and give them something to eat. Something struck me that said, you know what, I think that actually happened. I think that actually happened. It wouldn't happen the same way today, but it did then. It's exactly what happened because of the consciousness they lived in. Because their mindset was so absolutely open and so receptive that they hadn't evolved to being as, as their imagination was such that they could image and hold that that's all that, that's all that fit in was that world and this. There wasn't any commercial world. There weren't any other highways. Do you see what I mean? We are at this place now that is so far in a field where we have so many highways that we've lost the capacity to find that one major thread in us that we actually trust. It's so easy to let anyone's voice on any one of our highways. Even commercials influence you. Trashy commercials on TV. Even, even they can take your power. Even, even in, from insurance to this, think of all the things in this society that can take your power. So when, so when I think of questions like, I'm in a faith crisis, I don't know what to have faith in, I don't know what I believe, I don't know, the, the difference between where we started out and where we are now is it would, we, we are inclined to think because people were ancient that they were ignorant, that they didn't know anything, when in fact, they had an extraordinary clarity about the cosmos. They made it, didn't know how to drive a car. Or they didn't understand electricity. But who knows what they really knew about energy and matter. They seem to have understood those rules. And it's we that have to return to this understanding that if I say a word, one word, that word sets into motion a thousand consequences, not one. A thousand, not one. If I think a word, it's felt within the whole universe. The rules have changed, and what do I have to do in myself to change those rules? And that's what we have to look at. What laws do I have to, how do I have to understand the laws of balance? Do I need a spiritual practice? 
How do I have to live to up the game with myself? So my question to you for over dinner is where do you dwell? Do you dwell in fiction? What kind of fiction do you dwell in, in your imagination? And are you, do you get the question I'm asking you? And how much of your life is lived in fiction? That's a big question versus what you would call reality. That's a huge question. I want you to talk about it over dinner. And how much sleep do you live? I mean, I mean you're gonna, you're, I know that you're going to crash early tonight. A lot of you probably travel in, but that is an enormous question. How much of my life is fiction? Fiction driven. Now, do you have any questions before we tuck, tuck you off? <laughs> yes. Hi, my name's Ellen. El 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 Ellen? Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you for being here. I'm glad to be here. So, um, some of what you say tonight resonates to me. Uh, some of what you say tonight resonates uh, with regard to this, uh, the book, The Secret, where they talk about the uh, power of attraction and thoughts create things. Mm. And then, so I started to think about that and about fiction. And I was thinking, but because of that book, some fiction is positive, so in other words, creating in your mind where you want to be, where you want to go. So I just wanted to understand you, um, with regard to what we're talking about, balance and fiction. Do we have to balance that fiction? Because sometimes it, fiction will be very negative, and sometimes it will be positive. Is that correct? Or is that well, you know, this is where I think that if, you know, I'm going to speak to you as a spiritual director, and I would and as a spiritual director, I would say, um, how often do you get to go where you want to go? Meaning here. Anywhere. When you say, some of it is positive fiction, like I want to go here, and I get to create that. How often have you, has that been successful? Mostly yes. yes. And, and, and so, and what about the times when things haven't worked out? You would say you have nothing to do with that. Um, no, of course I have something to do with that. Not, yeah, a lot of choices that I make. Okay, but you really don't know what choices you make resulted in what consequence, really. You really don't. Because it's not, speaking to you as a medical intuitive, illness is not created that easily, and neither are the consequences or choices of our life. You know, I mean, obviously I could make the decision, I want to move to London. That's a clear this and that. Um, but even that choice, even the decision to wake up one morning and decide, I want to l go to London. Who knows if that thought is not at the tail end of a thousand other thoughts that finally inspired that one thought. The many times I've taught in London, the m all the books on English history that I've read, all my English friends, and then finally one day when the time was right, the thought came in and it said, now go. Because all the other synchronistic dynamics were finally lined up. So it could look like I chose and made it happen. But it's not really organized that way. Actually, that makes a lot of sense to me, also with regards to why I'm here today. Yeah. There was a bunch of things yeah. that happened in my life, and now all of a sudden I'm here. Yeah. It's more like that, just like it is with illness. Illness is not the result of one event in a childhood. 
that then somehow made you sick 60, 40, 21 years later. It's a, all of Washington DC would be sick. <laughs> and it's not the result of what we think of as negative. Nothing is that logical. God is not that obvious. And it's not so simple as negativity, this. Bad people are sick. But it doesn't work like that. It will never work like that. It will never, ever work like that. That's our desire to make everything simple and easy and one equals one equals one and one are two and see, that's the way it is. And if I could find my other one, I'll get two and that's that. It doesn't work like that at all. And, However. Yeah. Yes, no, 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 no. I was just going to say, and now, there is, of course, positive fiction. Um, yes, of course. Absolutely. I mean, it, it, like this. Here's positive fiction. Um, this will go on forever. No, it won't. But I like to think it. Okay? Or um, here's, the, you, you know, Positive fiction is that, you know, we were meant to be together. It's a great storyline, but there's no truth to that. You, you see what I mean? We could tell ourselves that, but, but um, if, if this person hadn't been there, someone else would have been. Someone else would have been. You know, I, I, I mean, I, th that's a positive fiction. You know, so that's, that's. There's only a certain amount of that positive fiction. Yes, no, no, I'm not, I'm not, I'm all for positive fiction. I'm all for it. But it's as much an illusion as negative. You know, like if, like I love, I love my house and if I ever left it, if you ever left it, what? Love it as long as you have it. And you won't fall apart when you leave it. But love it all the time. When I feel like I was meant to live here. Okay, feel like you were meant to live there. That's a positive fiction. Go ahead and feel like you were meant to live there. That's, that is how I feel. I feel like I was meant to live in the house. When I saw my house, you, you would think that I had found the love of my life. It's a house, for God's sake. But I would actually walk the neighborhood. I'd like thinking, I wonder how that house looks in autumn. I wonder how that house looks in spring. And my brother's convinced I psychically evicted the people who used to live there. Because <laughs> I, I went there for like six or seven years or something. You know, like I, I'd check it out. And then when, when it was time, you know, when they sold the house, I mean, I, I literally bought it. And, and, and within 24 hours, I had that house. I mean, I, I, I just literally. So I could tell myself I was meant to live there, and I actually believe that. So it's a positive fiction. But I mean, I can't imagine there's an off-planet God saying, give me the real estate for Oak Park. We're going to put Carolyn in that house. <laughs> but I th but I, at the same time, I, you don't know how things, if that house hadn't worked out, I would have found another place. And I would have made it cozy, because that's what I do. I'm a cozier. And I would have walked by and thrown apples at it. No, but you know what I'm saying. So we need positive fiction. We need all of that. But my, but um, positive fiction can also become is what inspires us. And positive fiction is also what inspires us to make positive choices. Is to act on things like I could do that. That could be me. I could be that ice skater. I could, do you see what I mean? It causes us to, to shoot for things like that. Oh, oh, okay then. Okay, so um, uh, you know what? If you, you, as you get to know each other this evening, I'm just gonna throw out the question that uh, throw out the suggestion that if you have an opportunity to discuss a little bit about fiction, like where do you dwell? You know, especially if 
It's, you know, see, test your time. How much of your fiction is negative and how much of it's positive? And on the negative, and then I'll shut up. If you tell yourself things like, my life could have been different if only. If you have any of that kind of negative fiction going on, you know. Okay, it's a pleasure. I look forward to our being together in the next couple of days. Thank you for doing, being here.